let me, of course, thank the organizers for, you know, putting together this really nice uh, workshop, which, uh, you know, also works, uh, of course, not as well, but also very well um, in this online format. Um, so I will, you know, pick up uh, upon a few um, topics which have already been presented today and also, um, you know, exploit a, a long introduction yesterday to these Kitaev systems because here my talk will be about um, a heterostructure of graphene on approximate spin liquid, and that will be related to, um, you know, a lot of the works that we've heard today on ruthenium trichloride. So that's um, why I want to be brief in my introduction. Um, so not repeat why spin liquids are fascinating and interesting, but let me also repeat something from the theory perspective that, um, you know, studying these systems is really something which is um, hard because they are really strongly interacting systems um, where, you know, usual perturbative methods don't work. And just to point out that, you know, it took almost 30 years until, you know, we are, uh, you know, it was a fine tuned, basically minimal model found that has an entire phase of, for example, this celebrated RVB spin liquid, where I write down here this uh, well known wave function. Now, it has a lot of properties why we're interested in, in studying it. For example, you know, these are. Uh, yeah, can be topological ordered and in particular also if you care about um, for example experimental responses you see that you have these unusual fractionalized excitations which have then these special statistics that you know in the long run have been proposed to be useful for something like uh, quantum computation but one other perspective um, why you know people have uh, thought about spin liquids is of course that you can actually also think of them as uh, parent states for um, unconventional superconductors. And here I just uh, plot this motivation, you know, this phase diagram of the, uh, this famous RVB mean field theory, where you see actually upon uh, doping such a um, spin liquid, you can actually get unconventional superconductivity and, you know, even understand a lot of under, uh, other phenomena, at least qualitatively, like the pseudo gap. So that comes back when we, you know, ask the question, why do you want to actually interface, um, you know, a mod insulating spin liquid candidate with something metallic. Um, now, again, the model that we're looking at or the system that we're looking at is the spin uh, one half honeycomb Kitaev model, which um, you know, has been introduced at length in other talks. Let me just remind you that uh, in the exactly solvable limit, we have actually a system where we have two types of excitations, fluxes and majoranas, and the majoranas, they form these um, Dirac um, cone excitations. Now, um, of course, we have now a lot of um, candidate materials following uh, George and Ginyat's work um, proposing um, how this can appear at, as a low energy description in uh, systems, systems with strong uh, spin orbit coupling. And, you know, one of the uh, most uh, studied materials is, of course, rutium trichloride. Just, you know, judging by the number of uh, reviews, including our own from a few years ago, um, you know, you see that there are really many developments in the field. Um, and, you know, they also now, this is one of the things which I think is really a nice development is also there are new material candidates for the spin liquid physics being um, proposed, you know, basically every few months. Now, um, one of the um, sad truths um, is that, you know, all the Kitaev spin liquid materials that we have, they are not genuine spin liquids, but in their pristine form, if you cool them to low temperatures, they actually do show long range magnetism. Now, then um, one of the things that we've done um, in collaboration here with a group from um, Oak Ridge, Steve Nagel, Alan Tennant, and uh, Anna Banerjee was that if you look, for example, at neutron scattering data and compare that to the exact um, dynamical response of the Kitaev spin liquid, it looks remarkably similar, similar. And then, you know, that led us to propose this idea of the proximate spin liquid, you know, basically thinking that you are um, somewhere in the vicinity of this um, genuine spin liquid, but there are some residual um, low energy instabilities to some long range ordered magnetic state. And then the motivation is, of course, that, you know, now to find suitable parameters to push it over the boundary. And um, that's one of the nice things of, you know, these solid state systems. There are many parameters that you can tune. So um, um, the most popular at the moment is, of course, magnetic field, as we've seen also in the previous talk. So here you see the phase diagram of this um, nail temperature as a function of in-plane field, and it goes, uh, it goes to zero, just above um, seven Teslas. And then the um, idea is that before you enter this relatively trivial high field polarized phase, um, there might be some intermediate interesting um, 
spin liquid that's uh, induced by the magnetic field. And here you get the neutron scattering data. So that's from this work, 2018, where at uh, for zero Tesla at low temperatures, you see these remnants of spin waves and then this broad scattering continuum that is related to this proximate spin liquid. And then that at ACE Tesla is completely the spin waves disappear and you're only left with this scattering continuum. And then here, that's in the supplementary material of that work, we actually hear the solid lines are finite temperature calculation for the Kitaev model. And you see that, you know, you can with a ferromagnetic Kitaev interaction of, you know, order 10 milliectron volt, you know, find fairly consistent um, description of these large scattering continua. And of course, big motivation comes also from this half integer quantized thermal hall um, effect that has been proposed and is um, debated. So we have heard already quite a lot about this. I don't want to, you know, stick with magnetic field, but actually um, introduce to you um, a different unique parameter, which I think has a lot of promise and also qualitatively new properties. And these are these thin film heterostructures. So the idea is that, you know, using thin films and putting them on substrates, you can do what's called substrate engineering. And um, that has been realized um, for alpha rotium trichloride. So here you see a schematic picture um, um, on graphene. And then you can basically put uh, contacts on the graphene and measure transport of that. So the question is, why do you want to do that? So, um, so the first thing why you might want to do that is similar to what people have done in these um, ordered ferromagnetic thin films like chromium bromide, where you can here also put um, this um, in contact with graphene. And then you can actually use the graphene as a sensor for the magnetic fluctuations. So in this case, just using, using you know, all the methods one has for graphene, uh, graphene transport, you might want to actually um, use that as a sensor for spin liquid-like fluctuations to pick that up. Um, and of course, you know, the other thing is that now, um, if you put met metal in contact with a, you know, putative spin liquid, you know, you might also hope that um, you, you might actually get um, some uh, charge doping into the spin liquid itself. Now, a few years ago, we paired up with, um, or actually the group of Rosa Valenti and uh, um, did the ab initio calculations for um, these heterostructures and um, also already advertised these uh, nice results, which were carried out by Sananda Biswas. And um, what you actually see is something, well, at least for me, rather surprising that there's actually quite a lot of going on when you put this mod insulating and trichloride layer on um, graphene, namely you have this really large charge transfer. Um, in particular, you see here that your um, Fermi level is shifted from the Dirac point by 0.6 um, electron volt. So you get a really highly doped um, interface. And that has also been you know, observed experimentally in recent years. The other thing is that one can then do, and you know, these are methods that the group of Rosa had developed over the years, is that you can then also ask, what would be the effective spin model that describes these you know, almost flat bands, which is the correlated B bands of the um, rotanium layer. And then when you do that, you can basically see that one of the problems is that you have a lattice mismatch between the rutamic trichloride and graphene that puts strain in. And we also know that um, you know, these relative interactions of the Kitaev, gamma, and uh, Heisenberg type are very sensitive to uh, strain. So in some sense, you, know, you can be lucky or unlucky, but it turns out that um, um, it seems that we are lucky that with this substrate-induced strain, the relevance of the Kitaev interaction with respect to the perturbing interaction that ultimately lead to long-range order um, you know, grows and really you move it towards this, um, this uh, dominant um, um, Kitaev interaction regime. Now, another thing that was observed in this uh, publication here um, um, from the Max Planck in Stuttgart, so that's the um, group of Marco Borkhardt um, in the CAM department. So they measured now the graphene um, resistivity as a function of magnetic field, and they saw these really nice quantum oscillations. And already here, if you look at the data, so the different colors are for different temperatures, you see something really strange, namely that if you look at the two Kelvin data, that's actually below, let's say the eight Kelvin data. Or here you see the amplitude as a function of temperature and it goes up and then goes down. And um, you know, if you are uh, not familiar with quantum oscillations, so you might basically think like, okay, so it's like a non-monotonic behavior. But um, I will explain you in a second that, you know, at least when we saw that, or when I saw that, then I thought really that um, that is at least something which is uh, fairly unusual to have some, such a temperature dependence, which is, um, you know, of this non lifshitz kosovich type. So the main question for basically, you know, the first part of the talk is um, really, you know, are these quantum oscillations, in particular, is non lifshitz kosovich behavior somehow related to the spin-liquid correlations? 
you know, and of course also how, how and could you possibly describe that? So here's my one slide recap on lifshitz kosovich theory, just, you know, knowing that the frequency of oscillations is proportional to the Fermi surface area. But let me point out that there is this universal temperature dependence, which, you know, can be calculated um, perturbatively, uh, perturbatively within a Fermi liquid description. And the main thing is really that the decay of the amplitude as a function of increasing temperature is governed by the effective mass of your quasi particles. So what you do is essentially, this is the amplitude versus temperature in all of these cases. And here are a few examples for iron-based superconductors uh, or cuprates. But let me here focus on this heavy fermion system um, where the amplitude, this is now a log scale. And then um, you see that from this formula that would give, give you an exponential decay. And from that, you can extract the effective masses. And here in this heavy fermion system, UPT3, you, for example, can directly in quantum oscillation see that you get you know, a hundredfold increase of the effective mass. So um, good, but the main thing is really that this universal temperature dependence is really observed anywhere and everywhere in good metals, weakly correlated systems, strongly correlated systems like cuprates, heavy fermions. And if you look for exceptions to lifshitz kosovich theory, you know, until a few years ago, you would have a really, really hard time, or at least I don't think there were any to that. So there was maybe serum cobalt indium vice where there's one earlier work where you have a magnetic uh, where you have a magnetic field induced magnetic transition and you get this non montanic behavior. But then the whole field really you know gained much momentum when there was this unusual observation in small hexaboride um, where in the low temperature state, which is supposed to be an insulator, um, you know you saw quantum oscillations only in the de Haas alpha effect. Um, and then this very unusual temperature dependence. And, um, you know, at the time a few years ago, we, we actually then realized that, you know, even within simple, you know, non-interacting band insulators, um, you know, you can actually get uh, quantum oscillations of this type. But um, I think, you know, there's still, you know, several or oh, many open questions in that regard. But for that talk, I want to, you know, pick up on a few earlier ideas, um, namely whether you can have quantum oscillations from fractionalized excitations. And um, this um, was first proposed in this really nice paper by Oleksandr Matrunic, who basically showed that in certain non-bipartite lattices, um, you can uh, couple the internal gauge field and the external gauge, uh, gauge field and get quantum oscillations in these spin liquids. And then we just heard this, uh, you know, really nice proposal from uh, N.T. Soderman in the previous talk, um, you know, who tries to reconcile this with uh, the experimental constraints. And let me also point out, this is the amplitude, the blue curve, as a function of temperature, which also has this non-monotonous decay. Um, you know, of course, we also thought about this. Um, so. Um, we were really worried about the fact that these oscillations started really small field deep in the magnetically ordered state. And they also, you know, persist above basically the state that would be the putative uh, spin liquid phase. So, um, you know, I think um, there's really much to be done for um, theorists and experimentalists alike. So what we wanted to do is to basically take our heterostructure and go back and understand these maybe more easily understandable quantum oscillations. And what we wanted to do is to start with a minimal model. And there we basically build upon work from um, Saif Meng uh, and Matthias Voita group, and also this work by Jung Bekin and Achim Rosch group um, on the Kitayev um, Kondo lattice model, where you assume that you have an insulating layer that would be a Deuterium trichloride layer described by a Kitayev model, and then you couple this with an itinerant layer, the graphene layer, by an S dot S condo interaction. And so then you get a really rich phase diagram with various phases, also your desired uh, superconducting phase. Um, however, there's also a large part of the phase diagram that is basically um, governed by a heavy Fermi liquid phase where you can effectively think, and we have heard you know, how we can think in terms of this phase in terms of fractionalization by talk by peers, that you have an effective hybridization induced between these C fermions of the graphene layer, and then here these apricosal fermions, which really start out to be, you know, um, emergent fermions, um, which um, doesn't carry any, any electric charge. Now, in this effective low temperature description, we have this heavy Fermi liquid phase, and then you can write down a mean field description for that phase. And here, just let me point out, these F fermions really come from an apricosal fermion description of the spin operator. And just um, here we uh, have this simple hybridization via the condo coupling, but you should really think of this as um, this condo induced heavy fermi liquid phase. Now we have basically an effective low energy description and you know the whole initial description 
um, of Rosa. So we could fit basically all the parameters here. Um, and that can basically determine anything but the condo scale because you know that is really small energy scale and you get all these different bands because the incommensurate lattice. Now the main thing for the quantum oscillations is that rather surprisingly um, the low energy model you can calculate the Landau level 3D exactly. Okay so you put on um, you know your um, usual orbital magnetic field that couples um, by the graphene layer and also induces that by the hybridization to these F fermions and then you get the exact Landau levels. And then, you know, you can use some tricks how to calculate um, the quantum oscillations. And it turns out that, um, so um, we could then in the end calculate the full um, generalization of the lifshitz kosovich theory, that now you basically get an oscillating term, which um, I'll explain in a second, and a new temperature dependence. So this temperature dependence is plotted here. So it's temperature versus doping away from the uh, limit where you're exactly at, um, the hybridization region between the um, um, you know almost flat band of the Kitaev layer and the broad um, Dirac band, and then you see that if you are um, right there, so you get this non-monatomic temperature dependence, and then if you shift the chemical potential, you go deep in the Dirac band away from the hybridization region. We basically recover the Lifshitz Kosovich theory. So now let's see how that compares. So um, we can just take our low energy model to fit it to the Apinicio, and you see that the frequency. You know, agrees really nicely. It's basically just set by the area and the shift here. Okay, so that's not really surprising. But what is about these signatures of, you know, the low energy physics? And that is now all hidden in the temperature dependence, where, you know, this is a little bit ugly looking formula, but here's the result plotted now amplitude versus temperature. And then the group of Marco Bocca, they worked really hard and measured additional samples. And because now this maximum here that you get, so you get a non monotonic. Uh, um, temperature dependence and this maximum is set now by the condor scale and that can of course fluctuate if you have inhomogeneities uh, from sample to sample but overall you actually see that within the treatment you see that the interplay of these Dirac electrons and these fractionalized excitations um, you know might actually give you this scenario that um, the, um, the coupling between um, the mod layer and the excitations of this former spin liquid now induce you these unusual temperature dependence of this one. Now, of course, that's a scenario. Um, and, um, you know, that one wants to test and we can discuss other scenarios, you know, other explanations for this maximum, um, maybe later over, over a coffee. Um, it would be really nice to, to see whether, for example, in SDM measurements or tunneling junctions, so one might actually see directly that one can um, um, see the, the states of the retaining trichloride layer. And another question is, you know, are there other experimental probes? And um, then after we had worked on that, um, you know, there appeared this paper from the group of uh, Dima Basov, which also looked at retaining tri uh, trichloride on graphene, and they measured plasmons. So let me just quickly run you through that. Um, and Elio, please give me a shout maybe a few minutes before the discussion session. Um, so what they did basically is they did these uh, scanning uh, near field optical microscopy uh, measurements where you come with an F um, AFM tip and then you can basically measure the local optical response and just from the uh, wavelength, the inverse of that and at which energies these appear, you can map the plasmon dispersion. So here the dots are the experimental data um, extracted via this and then the back Around is a theoretical calculation where you know you see that the large charge transfer basically accounts for most of the observation. And then there's also a proposal that the deviations come from coupling from phonons. But within the paper, they also see an unusually large damping of the plasmons at low energies, and they just speculate very vaguely that this might actually uh, have to do with uh, the the correlated retinium trichloride layer. So, you know, this poor damping was for us a motivation to ask the question, could these, you know, unusual plasmons and especially this behavior be a signature, again, related to these uh, spin liquid correlations. And then, you know, the question is again, how do you describe that? And we, we will again assume, you know, the same working hypothesis that, you know, we can describe the system in this heavy Fermi liquid phase with a very same model as before. And now um, the question is, what would be the charge response? What would be the plasmon? excitations uh, be in that system and how would the, uh, the correlations manifest themselves. Good. So four, um, minutes, four minutes plus questions. 
Okay, great. Good. So then what we did is you basically add interactions to this because you want to calculate collective modes and the key player is of course the Coulomb interaction. But one thing that we also wanted to take care with is, uh, of is you know, that we have on this um, correlated layer also residual contour interactions. And in particular, you know, thinking of where this whole effective description comes from, you know, we also want to incorporate a strong um, Hubbard interaction for these F fermions, which in principle originate from the fact that we started out with, um, you know, only a spin lattice. And then, you know, working in terms of these apricosa fermions, if you work in the infinite U limit, that would just basically enforce the single um, occupancy constraint. Okay. So then that's what we did. And um, then what you do is you calculate this, you know, uh, loss response function in terms of that dielectric function. And we, we basically did an RPA calculation um, where we take within the random phase approximation, not only the Coulomb um, interaction, but also these other interactions into account. So you can also, you know, we can just discuss details of that later. So here, let me run you through the results. So that's the first um, result where we basically just check what happens if we set all the additional interactions to zero and just treat the long range Coulomb interaction. And what you see is basically the result um, that you would expect for heavily doped graphene, you know, where this is the, the famous square root of Q plus one dispersion, but it looks very linear just because you are very far away from the Dirac point. And these are the optical plasmons. But then the interesting bit is you have a new low energy flat, flat plasmon mode here labeled by omega three. And this is something which had been noticed, you know, a long time ago um, by uh, Patrick Lee and Andy Millis, that in these heavy fermion states, you can get additional low energy plasmons, which is basically, you know, from the simple picture that you have this um, almost flat band appearing, which now requires uh, also charge degrees of freedom in the heavy fermion liquids. Now, what happens if you switch on a very large local on-site repulsion for the F fermions, you know, you get additional modes here um, coming from this correlated splitting off. And in principle, if you zoom in, it looks like a, you know, like a, a baby version of the big cross for the optical and plasmons from the large graphene, just because you have basically on this much lower energy scale, something similar appearing here. And then you can ask what now the additional interactions do and qualitatively they don't do much, but shift a little bit the intensity. And the main observation is really that now you get a really rich plasmon structure for these low energy um, excitations, and they really originate from this effective flat band that has formed from the correlated retained black chloride layer. And just for you know, the experts, this is a lot of the features we find are actually very similar to what are currently uh, discussed for plasmon excitations in the context of twisted bilayer graphene, where you also have basically an almost flat band with a very small kinetic energy. And then you can have what's called over the band plasmons, or you know, here, if you break, the sublattice symmetry, you can also have these plus ones with um, which are dichroactive and so on. But then, you know, let's come back to this uh, experimental motivation. The reason, you know, the problem with the experiment is really that they can only measure very um, at very small momenta. So here, what we did is we basically expanded our theory uh, in momentum space. And uh, then you put, uh, you really work out what, uh, you know, the momenta are in physical units and the blue are the experimental data of um, this, uh, measurements from the Basov group. And you see that um, under the assumption that we actually put in quite a large effective hybridization uh, in the system, we can actually get something that is um, pretty much consistent with the experimental data. But here, of course, our scenario is much different from any phonon-like explanation that now this additional damping, these broad excitations that they observe would now be related to the um, correlated um, retinum trichloride layer, ultimately to the interplay with these formally fractionalized excitations. And um, now, of course, it would be really nice if one can basically measure at large momenta and see whether one can see some of this, um, you know, almost flat correlated plasmons uh, in different experimental probes. So that's basically the end of the story. So here's a small summary um, there where we introduced these graphene heterostructures and um, treated an effective um, low energy model as a working hypothesis for some heavy family liquid description. Um, of um, this system. And then we looked at these quantum oscillations and found this non lifshitz kosovich behavior. And let me stress that the theory developed for that is also you know, applicable way beyond um, this particular system. Whenever you basically have an almost flat band hybridized with a broad Dirac band, you would get um, basically this temperature dependence. And then we also looked uh, recently at these uh, novel plasmons um, excitations there. And again, there, you know, that is consistent with the data, but of course, 
um, you know, to really distinguish that would be uh, really necessary to, to measure at much larger Q. So from that, let me thank you very much. So the um, collaborators here, so um, these uh, calculation for quantum oscillations we are done in, together with um, Rosa Valenti and let me really highlight all uh, the heavy lifting and the analytics was done by uh, my master student Valentin Leib. And uh, the plasmons uh, calculations were done really with uh, this uh, really excellent postdoc um, who recently joined us with the gym. Uh, and with this, let me thank you. I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>